Hello, welcome to your lesson on definite integrals. Okay, to begin today, we're going to talk about a little history about integrals. So the process of using sums of areas of rectangles to approximate the area under a curve is called a Riemann sum. So we've been talking about this idea of making rectangles under a curve and using the areas of all those rectangles to approximate the area under the curve. It's called a Riemann sum because it's named after the German mathematician uh, Georg Friedrich Bernhard Riemann. He lived during this time period here, and he generalized this process of using rectangles to find area. There are many software programs available for computing Riemann sums using areas of rectangles. Uh, one of this piece of software is the software on our TI-84 calculator. So again, we have many rectangles. We do make those rectangles so infinitely narrow that eventually it just spans the whole area like this. Okay, so to recap a few things, to find the area under a curve, again, we began with rectangles, and we can say this, for example. Let's, let's uh, pay close attention to this part here because it's going to lead to uh, some interesting things. So let's say you want the area of rectangle number three, this one right here. To find the area of that rectangle, we're going to do base times height, right? The base of the rectangle times its height, that will be its area. Um, to find the base, the base of this rectangle, we can just do 1.5 minus 1. And that gives us 0.5. So the base length there is 0.5. To find the height of this rectangle, we can say f of 1. Now, this is the part where uh, some students, when they first see this idea, they, it gets a little strange. But let's talk about that. To find out how tall this is, of course, on this graph, we can kind of see it reaches up to 2. So we can say, OK, I think it's too tall. But let's say that rectangle went somewhere in between those numbers. And you're wondering, how tall is it exactly? Well, here's the function we're finding the area under. And any time you take an x value and put it into this function, it gives you the y value. So in this case, we want the height of this rectangle. So we can put the x value of 1 into this function. And then that will produce the y value at that point right there. And that y value represents the height of the rectangle. right? So to find the height, we do f of 1. So again, we put 1 into here. And when you put 1 in here, you have 1 squared plus 1, which is 2. And that makes sense because when x is 1, y is 2, and that is our height. So make sure you really understand that part there where to find the height, we're taking the value of the function. OK, so now that we have that, we can say the area of the rectangle, that base times height, 2 times 0.5 is 1. So the area of that rectangle is 1. And then if we did uh, the sum, let's look at how I've written this, the sum of rect all the rectangles here, see rectangle n. And then we have here rectangle 1 through 4. So n can take values 1 through 4, meaning we're going to find the area of all those four rectangles, and we're going to add them up. And that's the total area under the curve here. So now let's look at that in terms of integration. So again, if we wanted the area of rectangle this one here, we're going to call it rectangle i. Then we need base times height. The base, as you can see here, is the change or delta xi. So it's saying the change of x values right here. Like here we had the change of x values of being 0.5. Here we have some unknown values. We just say the change of x values there. The height, again, is the function with this value of x, ci, plugged into it. And that will give you the height, just like we did here. We put that value in it to get the height. So that's the base and height. Therefore, the area of that rectangle must be uh, base times height. And then again, to find the whole area, we're going to do the sum of all those rectangles in there, saying from i is equal from 1 to n. So we have some number one uh, either from one rectangle all the way to some unknown number of rectangles and rectangles. So notice the, uh, the, uh, the similarity between that and that. These are the same formula. This one is done for these specific four. And this one is done as a general rule for all the n number of rectangles that we have there. But they're the same thing. Again, I just want you to see that this is your height and this is your base of a rectangle. Let's take that a step further. So the definite integral notation, because right now we've just been looking at some notation, but to change that to definite integral notation, this was introduced by German mathematician Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz uh, towards the end of the 17th century. So he basically took that rule, which we just looked at, the sum of all those rectangles, base times height, all those rectangles, and he converted it into this. He applied a limit to it. 
he said the area is when you take that function that we had here and you take a limit of it taking the change in xi values that that width of the rectangle and he said make that approach zero so in other words make those rectangles smaller narrower 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 until they become infinitely the the width is tiny basically the width does not exist in other and when you look at it in that way and there therefore you have infinite rectangles filling the space so he applied the idea of a limit which is a calculus idea um, and that basically is where our integral notation comes from this sum symbol is what that giant integral symbol is it's like a uh, a fancy s it means the sum of all those rectangles and now we're saying from a, a starting point a to a starting point b and then we have here these are the rectangles this is a the width of a rectangle the base and this is the height of a rectangle every point on the function is the height of each rectangle so knowing or seeing clearly that this is not some mysterious thing it comes from this idea of infinite rectangles added up is a really important connection this was a huge discovery or a something that uh, occurred in mathematics. Okay, now that you see that, where integration comes from, let's use it some more. Uh, but before that, let's look at the, the battle between Leibniz and Newton, who at the same time in the 17th century were developing calculus in different ways. And you saw a musical maybe called Calculus the Musical, which showed you this battle between these two minds in that century. All right, so you have seen the product, change in y or delta y or delta x, is the area of a rectangle. So again, delta y is that height, this is a, the width, and this gives us an approximation for the area under curve. So much like the quotient, so if you divided those, if you remember back to derivatives or differentiation, we are finding the gradient, and the gradient is change in y over change in x. So now for area, we have multiplication of those two. For gradient, we had the division of those two, or quotient, and uh, so that division, the gradient of a secant line, gave us an approximation for the gradient of a tangent line. So these are like the two branches of calculus we looked at. Multiplication of those is areas under curves or integration. Division of those was a slope of a tangent line or differentiation. In much the same sense that multiplication and division are inverse operations, Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz independently came to realize that differentiation and the definite integrals are also inverse processes. And we've seen that. We know integration is the reverse process of differentiation. So it's this, in very simple terms, it shows us this important idea that we've been looking at. So that led us to, or leads us to, what is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. If it's called fundamental, it must be important. So take a moment to read this. Pause the video. And now let's talk about it for a moment. Basically, it's saying, if you have a function that's continuous, that means the function has no breaks in it between a and b, then uh, if you take the integral of that function like this, you get this antiderivative, right? If you take the integral, you get the antiderivative, and from a to b, that antiderivative, uh, we can plug in those values, b here minus the function, the antiderivative of a plugged into it, and we can subtract those to get the integral value. This is something we looked at briefly already, and we're going to look at more today. So this idea right here, taking the integral and getting this. So that's uh, some students ask sometimes, OK, so why when we take an uh, integral, usually we have to write plus c. So why are we not writing plus c here when we take the antiderivative of that? Why is there no plus c? And the reason for that is uh, if you took the like that, instead of f of x, we had f of x plus c. And then you substituted b in there, subtracted that same function with a substituted in it. Notice that the c minus c, those c's cancel, and we get back to here. So that plus c is unnecessary when we're doing a definite integral, because once you do the substitution, the c's cancel anyway. OK, so there's our fundamental theorem. Let's make more sense of it by referring back to an example we had seen uh, in the last video, I think. So we had a, we we're trying to find the area under this curve. We know the curve is x squared plus 1, and we're looking for the definite integral from 0 to 2. And there, so you take the integral of that, you get 1 third x cubed plus x, and then you have these bounds of differentiation, or sorry, of integration. And that means first you put 2 into this antiderivative, minus, and then you put 0 into this antiderivative. So you subtract those two, and you get that. That represents the area. So that right here is the fundamental theorem of calculus in action. Like all this here is exactly what we see happening here. Make sure you see the connection between that and that. 
So now that you've seen that, uh, let's do one last historical note, and that is this uh, other famous mathematician, Augustin Louis Cauchy, was the first mathematician to formalize and prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. So he took the work that he saw before him, and he formalized this, this work here. OK, let's take some notes. So let's go back to the problem uh, you saw in the opening slide, the, the kind of joke. There's a, a vegetable garden. It's 20 by 30 feet wide. So a simple way to find the area of that vegetable garden would just be 20 times 30. That's too simple, though. Let's, let's make this more complicated, because we want to use calculus. So we know the area is 600, but how can we do it using calculus? Well, what if you put that rectangle on an ax, a set of axes here? Here's 30, here's 20. We know this function on top here is y equals 20. So now, what would be integral to solve that area? Well, here's that integral from 0 to 30. We're taking the integral of the function f of x dx, and the function is 20, so we're taking the integral of 20. Now, when you take the integral of 20, you get, well, you get 20x. And now our bounds of integration are 0 and 30. Put in 30 in there, 600. Put in 0 in there, 0. 600 minus 0 is 600. We can confirm the area is the same as this using integration. I love that great little cartoon showing the power of integration for finding area. Okay, so try these. Evaluate each of these without using a calculator. So these are non-calculator questions. Um, can you do it? For A, check your work here. We take the integral, so we have that. We write the antiderivative, and our boundaries are 0 to 3. Plug in 3 first, then plug in 0, subtract the 2, and you get this value here. Try B. In B, uh, we have... This, when we see 1 over 2, two t, we know that is uh, antiderivatives ln t. And our bounds are 2 to 6. Plug those values in, and we get this. By the rule of subtracting um, logarithms, we know that becomes a division within one log. So 6 divided by 2 is 3. And c, try c. In c, again, the antiderivative is this. We have our boundaries here. Plug in 2 first. Subtract the other one with zero in it, and you get your final definite integral. Again, each of these represents the area under that function between those two x values. OK, next, some that are a little tougher in terms of the integration. So those are the easy integration. These are a little tougher. So what would you do here? Hope in the first one you notice you can you can multiply through there because we don't have a product rule for integration. So you can multiply that through. That multiplied through becomes this. Now integrate that to get the antiderivative here. Our boundaries are negative 2 to 2. That means you substitute 2 in there first, and then you substitute negative 2 in there, and you subtract those two to get this value. These are still non-calculator questions, so all this fractional work you should be able to do without a calculator. So keep challenging yourself for the next few to do without a calculator. Try this one here. What would be the definite integral there? OK, in this case, uh, maybe you notice that we have one of these ones with a power rule, and then we have a linear component inside. So we're going to take the uh, antiderivative of the power rule, which means raise this by 1, and put a 1 quarter in front. And then since we have a linear piece inside, we put a 1 half in front as well to uh, the reverse process of that. So we have this, and our bounds are negative 1 to 0. So we put 0 in there, minus put negative 1 in there, and subtract those two to get 0 in the end. That area is 0. Last two, try C. In this one, check your work here. That root is a half power. Apply the power rule. Apply the rule about having a linear component by multiplying by 1 quarter. And then plug in the values of 1 and negative 5 quarters. Again, this is all non-calculator, so you should be able to do this without a calculator. And last one, D. Uh, again, a little bit tougher, but maybe you can notice you can actually divide away here. So divide this, divide this, see if you can simplify it first. So that simplifies into these two fractions. Then you can cancel some things here and here. Take the antiderivative to get this. And then you have your boundaries 1 and 3. So you put 3 in there, minus put 1 in there, and you should get this value at the end here. OK, great job. Uh, some of those are challenging. We'll see you in class to practice some more.